Morning. I was thinking, many of us, uh, many of you, you know, played a lot of different roles in your life. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of hats you wear sometimes, right? You know, and, and, uh, um, and if you've lived long enough, um, and I can see that some of you have, um, um, you've seen roles that you had in life begin, then you've seen them sometimes end. Right? I mean, that's just how, how life works, you know, and, and, and uh, sometimes our roles change through personal choice, you know, we make a choice that we get married, so, so you assume the role of a spouse, right? You, you, you have children, and so you assume the role of a parent, right? And you change careers, you, become, you were a butcher, now you're a baker, and then you, you want to become a candlestick maker or something like that, right? You know, and, and, uh, um, you know, and then other times new roles are are just kind of thrust upon us. Um, and uh, they're not always welcome sometimes. You know, we lose our job. And so we become an unemployed guy. You know, um, you, our spouse dies. And so we become a widow or a widow, widower. Um, you know, we get an unwanted diagnosis and we become a, a cancer patient or something like that, you know. And, and, uh, and, but I would argue that, and I think what this is what Paul's doing in this letter we've been going through, that these roles, the, that whatever your present role is, that's not your identity. That's not who you really are. And, and our identity is, is something deeper than that. You know, and in fact, the history behind the word role, okay, is interesting and it speaks to this truth. The, our English word role, okay, has its origins in, it's a French word that it was from, but it was the roll of paper, okay, that actors' lines were written on. Okay, and, and so an, an actor gets a part, right? And he, that actor, he or she, assumes a role, right? And, and, uh, the, but the, the, the actor is not the character, right? The, 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 role, uh, the role they're playing, you know? They're assuming a role, right? And, and it's not their identity, okay? It's, it's, they're playing a role, but it's not who he or she is. Do you follow that? Okay, yeah, and when the show is over, Okay, if it's a professional actor, they're, they're hopefully going to move on to another gig, right? You know, and, and get a new role, okay? They're just simp they simply be, they're simply people who are capable of stepping into certain roles, okay, and performing it the best that they can. The roles, whatever the roles that we play in life, um, do not define us, okay? They're simply something that we do, okay? And, and this is what's behind Paul's letter to the Ephesians, okay? And he's, what he's saying is, in Christ, we've heard this over and over through this letter, we have a new identity, okay? And our identity is something deeper than whatever role we're playing in life. Our circumstances and roles change, right? But our identity in Christ never changes. It's, it's stable, okay? Seasons of life come and go. But our new identity in Christ is unchanging. It's it's just who we are now. And 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 our, our and here's the thing, our identity in Christ is also portable. It goes wherever we are, right? And and so we carry our new identity with us, okay? And our and we carry our new identity into every role that we play in life. And that's what Paul's talking about here, especially in chapters four and five of, of this book. And we're now we're now in six, in the first part of chapter six. And our new identity in Christ sometimes drives and determines the roles we take on in life, okay? And, and our new identity in Christ, though, is always meant to influence whatever role we're, we're playing that we fulfill. It's always supposed to be there influencing the way we fulfill that role. And, and, uh, and, and there's a section that we've been looking at for these last few weeks. He's specifically applying this idea to our home life, okay? And, and so he says, be filled with the Spirit, okay? We talked about the pudding of the Spirit. It transforms the cake. It transforms the batter, okay? And, and, um, and he will, he, what he'll do as a human being, as, as an individual living within a family, it'll start to change you. And when you live with people that change in positive ways, that's kind of transformative for the family. It might be confusing at first, right? What's going on with them? And, 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 uh, and what he talks about first, he says, he says, make music in your hearts to the Lord. Okay, they have this internal soundtrack playing inside of you, joyful music, okay? And, and, and it'll transform your attitude and, and it'll transform it into one of thanksgiving and gratitude, okay? And, and, 
And then, he, and then what happens is it's, it's, he, he says it starts to leak out of you. Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs among yourselves. Let that soundtrack leak out of you, okay? Let it, let it go. Let it, let it out and start to infect the other people in your family. And then he specifically applies it to the role of married people, okay? Some of you are married, right? And, and, uh, um, and he says that if we do this, it'll transform our marriage. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, into one of mutual submission, where we're giving each other, we're serving each other, okay? He says, he says further submit to, to one another, okay, out of reverence for Christ, okay? You see, when, when each partner in a marriage relationship begins to internalize the truth, that, that the Son of God served me, okay? So how can I demand anything from my spouse, okay? I, he served me, now I need to turn around and serve this one that I've committed myself to, right? Make sense, you know? That internalized truth starts to find external expression, and the motto in the family, in this couple, becomes not, not, it's not about me anymore, it's always gonna be about we. Okay, I'm, we're going to do that that way. The dominant question becomes, Christ served me, so how can I serve you? Right? Does that follow? When we're clear in their heads, at least, right? We get there. And, and all of which tends to transform the whole family. Think about it. When a home is populated by people who've got this pleasant soundtrack going on internally, and it starts leaking out of them, okay? Um, and and there's, it creates a joyful atmosphere where there's harmony in a home, okay? And is led by those who have a Christ-like love and posture of service to each other, okay? It tends to positively influence the children that are in that home. You, you follow that, okay? And, and producing increased likelihood, okay? One, that they're gonna be secure. What a kid needs more than anything, they don't need all the toys you buy them and all the opportunities you give them and all that. What they need more than anything is they need to know that mom and dad love each other. Mom and dad, they, they model that, they serve each other, okay? And that, what that does is it prepares a kid for life. It makes them resilient in life. It makes them secure in their life and prepares them, okay? And makes it more likely that the children in that home, there's, a, there's an upside for the parent, okay? The children will obey their parents, as he says in verse one of chapter six, okay? Because you belong to the Lord and this is the right thing for you to do, honor your father and your mother. Because it tends to produce trust in the household. If my mom and dad ask me to do something, I'm gonna trust them that it's gonna do, they're asking me to do the right thing. And it tends to create children who want to please their parents, okay? They'll, they'll tend to obey rather than, they won't think of it as obeying or disobedience. They'll want to, they'll want to they don't want to disappoint their parents, okay? Does that make sense? And then when discipline occurs in that home, it's, a, it's an occasional experience, okay? It, it's an exception to the normal order of the home, because sometimes it's necessary, but it's, it's more the exception, okay? And discipline always occurs within the context of unquestioned acceptance and love, okay? And so when everyone in the family, okay, here's the thing, when everyone in the family starts to lean into their identity in Christ, it transforms everyone, and no matter the role they fulfill, whether they're a husband, a wife, a, a child, okay, all these adjustments to the soundtrack in the home, the attitudes in the home, along with all the harmony that starts busting out in, this, in all this stuff, where people are, the family structure, is, it's just, it just functions. And then he applies it to the last piece of the first century Roman world family structure. He says that it'll even transform the master-slave relationship. Think about that for a second, okay? Isn't that awesome? Okay? You see, when everyone's filled with the Spirit and leans into their identity in Christ, it even transforms the master-slave relationship in profound ways. It got kind of quiet in here, okay? Some of you look a little confused, right? And, and uh, transform the master-slave relationship. I mean, what's going on here? Let me read what comes next, okay? It's a little bit confusing, okay? He says, this is, but this is what the text says. He says, slaves, okay? And what's in view here are household slaves, okay? It, Obey your earthly masters with deep respect 
and fear. It's the same words that deep respect and fear that Paul uses like in Philippians chapter 2, okay, where he says, you know, in your relationship with God, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And then immediately after that, he says, do everything without grumbling. In other words, have great reverence for the, this role that you're fulfilling, okay? Work it out. And then he says, serve them, slaves, serve your master sincerely as you would serve Christ. Try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching you and have their eye on you, but as slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. Work with enthusiasm, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will re reward each one of you for the good we do, and whether we are slave or free, masters, and then he says, masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven, and he has no favorites. He shows no favoritism, no matter what your role is in life. Now, let me explain a little bit here, okay? Do we need to explain this a little bit? Is it a little confusing? I mean, you know, it, it, this is confusing, okay? Um, this letter was written to a group of believers, okay, who lived in a culture, okay, that was first dominated by the Greeks and then by the Romans, okay? And we're not going to give you a whole history lesson on that. But within the family structure of these cultures, there, it was common for there to be husbands and wives, okay, common for them to be children, and it was common for there to be household slaves, if, if you were a wealthy family, okay, and you could, you could afford that. Now, in that, in that world, there were tens of millions of slaves in the, Rome, in the whole Roman Empire, okay, and, and possibly up to one-third of the population. Think about that for a second. Lots, okay? And, 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 and now, from a moral point of view, this has to be said, right? Um, Slaveholding is an abhorrent thing. Okay, it, it's especially when you think about the way it was practiced in our country historically. Amen. Amen. And and uh, um, slavery is a, is a continuing stain, okay, on our collective history, and it even spills into t today in many ways. And and uh, that that the legacy. And I believe that a hundred percent. Okay. And and. Uh, but it's important to point out a couple of things, okay? Um, in the, the system of slavery in the Roman era was different, okay, than what we think of what happened in our country, okay? And, and uh, first of all, it was not racially based, okay? That's not the, how it worked. Slaves came from all different kinds of backgrounds, okay? And, and, and it was generally not as brutal a system, okay, as, as, as it was in our history, in our culture, and what we think of, okay? And, and the how, there were, these were household slaves that were in view, and, 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 and generally speaking, it wasn't true always. This is why he has to give an instruction, okay? Um, that they were more well cared for than what we think of from our history. And, and, and in fact, some household slaves, check this out, they actually chose to become slaves. Okay, because it made their lives better, because they didn't have opportunities, and it put them in a better living situation. It was more like an indentured servant, you know. They, 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 they dedicated themselves to somebody, and, and that was the pathway in for some. And they were allowed to possess money, and they were allowed to own property even, okay. And, 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 and many would eventually gain their freedom, and some of them would, would sometimes they were just set free, okay by the benevolence of their master, and, and, and some actually got their wherewithal to be able to purchase their freedom, okay? Because they were allowed to have possessions and monies and all this kind of stuff. You know, now that was true more for household slaves than it was for some other kinds of slaves. If you were a POW, a prisoner of war, someone captured in a war against the Romans and stuff, oftentimes, things didn't work out very well for those people. They'd go work in these horrible conditions in mines and places like that, and they just, they, they, their, their life expectancy was real short. They were treated harshly and poorly. And so it's, it's kind of like all over the map in this ancient world, okay? But as I said, there was a large percentage of the population who were slaves, okay? And, and, and so think about it for a second. In the early history of the church, as the church just started taking off, this is Ephesus, which is in modern Turkey, okay? And, and, uh, and, the, and if there was a house church, 
okay, of people who are now believers in, in Christ, say there were 40 or 50 people in that house church, okay, and, and with the percentage of people in the population that were generally slaves, there might be 15, 20, even 25 people in that congregation of maybe 50, okay, who might be slaves. And, 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 and maybe more, because here's the thing, as the church just started to expand, it was often the lower classes. It was people who had less opportunity, okay, whose lives were harder, okay, that were drawn in large numbers to the good news that Jesus came and offered the world. Do you follow that? Okay, so churches would have slave and free mixed in there, and it wouldn't just be like, oh yeah, there's one slave over there in the corner or something like that. There'd be a fair number of people, okay, in there and stuff. And it, so in this, Paul is assumes that slaves are full members of the church, okay? And all believers, okay, no matter the role they play in society, are on equal footing in terms of their identity now in Christ, okay? And that's clear in this passage, and Paul also says that in other places. For instance, like in, in 1 Corinthians 12, he says, just as there's one body, he's making a body like an analogy to the church, okay? One body, though it has many parts, okay? They all, these parts all together, they form one body, okay? One church, okay? And so it is with Christ, he says. He says, for we were all baptized by one spirit, so to form one body, okay? Whether Jew or Gentile, okay? Insider or outsider, religiously, slave or free, we were all given one spirit to drink from. And, and in, in Colossians 3, he says this, here in this church, there are no Gentile or Jew distinctions, okay? There's no circumcised or uncircumcised. There's no Scythian or barbarian, okay? With different, different classes, ethnicities, and, and, and there was no slave or free. Equal footing, okay? Because is, Christ is in all, okay? And he's in all of us. We have, equal, uh, we have equal standing when it comes to our identity. So no matter the role, okay, we all share the same identity. Okay, doesn't matter. Okay, we have this identity now in Christ that supersedes whatever role we might play. So Paul gives basically three instructions to any slaves that might be in the church. And he says this, obey your earthly masters. Okay, and it, now, it, it, what, what's happening here is Paul is not challenging, okay, the social order. He's saying, hey, within the social order that's existing in our world, here's my instruction to you. He's offering a perspective, okay, by which those who have received the identity of being in Christ, okay, um, to live out their faith in the particular role they play in that society, okay, which is a lesser role, but nevertheless, it doesn't matter because in Christ, by our faith, we understand that we all have equal footing before Christ, okay? Does that make sense? He's offering the 30,000 foot view. And, 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 and then he says this, he says, live like slaves of Christ, okay? Play this little mental gymnastics, spin it, okay? Spin it, yeah, you have an earthly master, but serve that earthly master like you were serving Christ as your, as your master. Paul reminds them that their true allegiance, okay, and ownership doesn't lie in the role of a slave with a human master. He's saying, that, don't think of it that way. He's saying, your identity is with your heavenly master. Okay, that's, that's who you, you owe allegiance to, okay? And it, it, you belong to Christ, and you're obligated to serve him. And then he says this, hey, within all that, serve wholeheartedly, okay? And don't hold back from fulfilling your role. Embrace the role that you find yourself in. And instead, as you do this role, you're going to find confidence as you gain this understanding that your identity is in Christ and all that, it's all that really matters. In Him, you're free, okay? Understand it that way. And then Paul turns to the masters and he tells them, don't use intimidations or threats, okay, in, in your dealings with those who are in, in the subservient role, okay? You know, you know because they, they are subservient. Okay, in this social structure, right? And, and, uh, but he said, don't, he says this, don't forget 
you share this. If you're a believer in Christ, you, sh you too share the... You're brothers. Okay? You're sisters. You share the same identity in Christ. So treat them with civility. Treat them with gentleness. And after all, he says, there's no favoritism when it comes to our Heavenly Master. He doesn't care that you're like the, the guy that wears the big hat in the, in, in the world. He, he could give a rip. Okay, it doesn't matter. The wealthy slave owner has no special favor before God, no, no, based on their social standing or something like that. And he, he tells them, hey, don't forget that. Don't forget it. It's, so Paul, what Paul is saying, okay, he says that the, the gospel, okay, this idea of being in Christ, it transforms even the master-slave relationship. Don't think that it doesn't because it's meant to, okay? The gospel creates equality, okay? What, the Roman culture and the laws associated with that created obvious inequality in their world, right? I mean, it's just, it's just amazing, okay? But in verse nine, Paul says, remember, you both have the same master, okay, in heaven, and he has no favorites, okay? He views every human equally, okay? You, you have one master, and you are equally responsible to him. Make sure that you put that, bake that into the cake, you know, and, and, and it speaks to roles and identity, okay? Um, you, you know, he say, he's speak, saying to the slaves and the masters, he's saying, you find yourselves in different roles in the social structure of our world, okay? And in this, you have unequal roles, okay, with differing duties and responsibilities. And, 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 but your roles do not define your identity. That's not who you really are. Like an actor playing a role, okay? This is just the role you play in the world right now, and, and, but that's not who you are, okay? Identity, you have the same identity, okay? And, and, and in this, you have, you have unequal roles, but in this identity that you have, there's complete equality. There's complete sameness, okay? It's the same duties to serve your heavenly master. It comes with the same set of responsibilities to do it in the right way, to equally serve your heavenly master, to equally serve together as you work together in this world. And, and so here's the thing, and this is the point I want to make. This was a, a passage, I, believe me, I was tempted to skip over. Can you understand why? <laughs> No? <laughs> really, some of you just want to get up here and do this one, right? You know, and, and, uh, um, but I, the way I look at this passage is it, it, it seems strange, okay, in, if, at first, okay, to hear instructions given to Christian slave owners, okay? Because, you know, on a, on a moral basis, that's a weird idea in a lot of ways. And, 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 uh, but it turns out, you know, the whole idea behind these instructions is profound and it's liberating. It turns out that that's the truth. In Christ, it doesn't matter who you are. The homeless guy living over in front of Home Depot down in Escondido, okay, that, that there's, there's an equality, there's a humanity that we all share, right? And, and, and our identity, if we're in Christ, is way more important than whatever role we might fulfill in our society or what kind of circumstances we find ourselves in. Roles and circumstances change, okay? But our new identity in Christ does not change. It's, that's who you are, okay? Seasons of life come and go, okay? But our identity in Christ is stable. Don't forget it. And our new identity in Christ is portable, okay? We carry our new identity in Christ wherever we go. Okay? And our identity in Christ is meant to affect the way we fulfill whatever role we have in this life, where, however we find ourselves. Our identity in Christ, too, teaches us to treat others with humility and with humanity. Okay? What I mean by that is we received our identity. We learned this as we were going through this through no accomplishment of our own. It was simply given to us as a gift. Even the faith that we have, Paul said early in this letter, is a gift from God. That he gave you the grace you needed um, to even respond to the offer that he, that he gave you. And, and so don't forget that. Be humble. You, you're not good enough. You didn't earn enough merit badges or anything like that. That's not how it works. Okay? And then, and then, and then it also is, te reminds us to treat others with humanity. Okay? At the end of the day, we all share a common humanity, right? 
You know, we go through struggles. We go through stuff. At the end of the day, our life here on this earth ends just like everybody else, okay? And no matter your social standing, that's what's true for all of us. And, and, and so when we grasp this, it speaks to our inner life. It helps us, you know, understand how privileged we are that God has given us this gift and this standing before him, okay? The one who could squash us like a bug says, no, we're, I'm, you're our, we're, we're friends. You're a part of my family, okay? And it should inform our marriages and, and, and it should influence our family life and it should transform, like if you take the slave idea and stuff, you know, the, the employer-employee relationship, bring it up to a more modern day and more modern application, the way you treat any employees you might have, the way you treat your employer and how you view your role within that company, that organization, and, and, and it empowers. When we, when we have humility and, and, a, and a sense of our own common humanity, it empowers harmony in our communities, okay, and, and eliminates so much of the, of the stupid stuff that goes on in our world, okay? And if we find ourselves, another part of this too, is if we find ourselves being mistreated in this world, you know, um, you know, the, uh, it's a reminder of our identity is, is that nothing separates us from the care and concern of our Heavenly Master. Nothing separates us from that, you know. When we're going through hard stuff and, and they're being mistreated deliberately, okay. If we find ourselves even imprisoned, okay, we can endure it with a wry smile, okay. You know, kind of which belies the hidden truth that, that in Christ we're free inside. We have freedom. That's our identity. That's who we are in Him. And, and, and if we find ourselves in an unjust situation, you know, and at the end of the day, He reminds these masters that at the end of the day, justice will prevail. He's not, a, he's not a respecter of persons or social status or anything like that. He's an impartial judge, okay, that will make it all work out right. So it turns out this is, a, in a lot of ways, I think, a surprising teaching. It takes this idea, idea of identity and, and, and takes it to a whole different level, okay? It's one thing to think about your relationship with your spouse. It's another thing to think about your relationship with your kids. But when he starts, he's, now he's starting to pick at stuff that's going on in the world. And we also know that eventually, even with the horrible system of slavery that we had in our country, okay, it was Christians who led the way of ending that system, okay? As we start to bring this, this truth and, and this idea of God's graciousness to us into our world, as individuals start to get affected one by one, one by one, one by one, it starts to fray the injustices and the wrongs in our world because people start realizing that they serve this one, okay? It's not gonna happen through social action, it's not gonna happen through legislation, but it happens when people's hearts and minds get turned and, and then they start, they start influencing the world in a positive way, and it's transformative. That's the mission. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that our identity is formed in Christ. This is who we are. You tell us that. Help us to believe it, Lord. Help, our, help our, those times when we have unbelief about that truth, Lord. But we thank you for your acceptance. You accepted us in spite of who we are and how we are. You, you, accept, you, you show us your compassion, okay, in spite of who we are. You reveal to, your, to us your truth, Lord. Teach us how to act on your truth until we speak truth with unquestioned acceptance and compassion towards those we speak it to. And Lord, teach us how to serve, to do good things in this world so that people might say, thank God you showed up. I don't know what I would have done without you. Thank you for the privilege of serving you from this identity, this strong identity we have in Christ. It's in your name we pray. Amen.